all the books. It, it, it's time for book reviews. Hello everyone and welcome to Folkmasters Vlog for the Warm and for the Fast and Gaming System, created by Games Workshop based in the UK. And welcome to book review number 113. Today I'm reviewing the novel called Angels of Caliban, written by Gav Thorpe. It is his second full-fledged novel in the, in the Horus Heresy series, the previous one being Deliverance Lost. Uh, so if you saw my previous uh, review, you might have picked up that Gaff Orp has 14 years of experience writing The Dark Angels as of 2017. But with all said, we begin to talk about the front cover for this novel. On the front cover we see the big duel between the Lion and Conrad Curse in the climatic final battle of the novel. The details are amazing and I like the fact of how true Curse is to his model made by Forge World. I weren't the biggest fan of his face in the distance, as it looks a bit too cartoonish, but zooming in on it, it looks quite fine. The lion surprised me as well to have a free day beard, but with all this taken into account, I will give this front cover an 8 out of 10 forks. Let's see what this story is all about. With the Dark Angels spread across 100 systems, Primarch Lion L. Johnson stands as Lord Protector of Ultramar. Though his true motives are known to few indeed, and old rivalries on their home planet, home world threaten to tear the Legion in half, but when the world comes uh, of the Night Lord's attack on Sofa, the Lion's brutal actions brings Imperium Secundus once again to the brink of civil war. Not even his most fearsome warriors of the Dreadwing, nor any arcane secrets of the Order, can guarantee victory if he sets himself against his loyal brothers. So a recommended reading order prior to this is the novel Descent of Angels, Call of the Lion, a short story in the anthology called Tales of Heresy, Fallen Angels, the short story Savage Weapons, the novella The Lion, the novella Prince of Crows, the short story By the Lion's Commands, the short other drama and later on short story Cypher, the Guardian of the Order, the other drama and later on short story The Long Night, and then the other drama and then later on short story Master of the First. It also makes a small references to the other drama called Grey Angel. Then we have the Imperium Secundus plotline starting with the Unremembered Empire, the Herald of Sanguinius, the Heart of the Pharaoh's other drama and then the Pharaoh's novel. Then as a good supplement I would recommend that you read The Angels of Darkness, Forbes first dwell into Dark Angels and their storyline. Uh, it, it, it's not necessary, but a few characters do pop up in that novel, as you will also see in this one. And you will see them in two different timelines, to say so. So this novel opens up with a prologue set in the year 970 M30, making it roughly 41 years prior to the present day and exactly 100 years after the Battle of Dulan. It takes place on the planet of Saramund, which recently had been brought back into compliance after revolting. Two giant ships floats in orbit, the Vengeful Spirit and the Terminus Est. They are holding a victory feast, where important figures like Lieutenant Commander Kalos Typhon attends together with other officers of the Luna Wolves and the Dark Angels. He introduces himself to Luther, who is the leader of the contingent of the First Legion. They begin to bond with each other, and, the ty and Typhon can definitely understand why Luther as a non-Astartist could rise to the position of first captain with his leadership and confidence. They exchange past experiences with each other. This prologue also explores Typhon on a new level of being unappreciated by his Primarch and his warp gifts being disdained. Luther and he, and he bonds extra much on this fact actually. It also reveals that Typhon had begun to dabble with warp powers as he recalls Davin for such practices and is quite familiar with the Plague Father Nurgle already. Unfortunately, it doesn't get time to develop any further than that. The conversation is interrupted by the arrival of Erebus, whose presence is quite strange considering that he didn't join the Luna Wolves until much later, and only six years after Monarchia. It could be that he is out scouting for the future. One can only guess. Their celebration is cut short when the lion arrives, furious to find that the Luther has left his post on Caliban, essentially breaking his orders. The lion even calls out horrors for spending his son's life so carelessly. The Battle of Saramund was mentioned in the other drama Grey Angel, which I at the time was annoyed at because Luther was described to have only been in one real campaign, 
but this no novel sort of fixes that by saying that Luther sent out the scout organizations, as seen in the Wolf King, and aided those who, who sent out help without the approval of the Lion. But this in turn led to them being stranded on Caliban with no transports available. And this is a deep cut reference that I almost missed. The novel then jumps back to the year 011M31 in the present day in Ultramar. Following the events of the Unremembered Empire, the Lion is still the Lord Protector of the Imperium Secundus. He is out on the hunt for Conrad Curse, who has evaded them for the past couple of years. He is still furious for what happened in the Frama system. They come across a planet by the name of Sethaf, and he argues with his closest lieutenants, Redloss and Holguin, about the Night Lord's Primarch's whereabouts. Reading into decoding riddles, he theorizes that the Curse is on the planet. They travel to the planet, where most of the Void Support ships escapes in time, but the ones located on the planet is left behind. What they find is a bastion built entirely out of skulls of the population of the planet, which included a number of as much as 5 million people. It leads into a battle where the remnants of the World Eaters and Word Bearers are killed and a few remaining survivors are rescued. Where they thought that Dark Angels would remain to secure them, they are left to fend for themselves, as the Lion doesn't have the resources to leave his sons behind. Only materials and some weapons, something they don't take kindly to. When they return back to orbit, they come face to face with a creature known as Tushultra. It's a boy who looks no older than 10 years old, but with a wrinkled skin as an elder. It is embedded with the machine that the Dark Angels found in the Lion novella. As you can see in the image, he looks really creepy and is connected with the engine and possibly a creation of the warp. It's with terrible news that they find out that the beacon on the Pharos has gone out. The Lion decides to return back to McCrag to find out what actually happened during the Pharos novel. Well back on McCrag, he meets b with both his brothers, where he also finds out about the assassination attempt, the scene which was my favorite from the Pharos. When the Lion would finally get the meeting with Sanguinius, where he retells what he was told by Curse. The Blood Angel then says that Curse was on McCrag all of this time. Sanguinius re then reveals his vision that he knows he will die by the hands of Horus, either at Terra or at McCrag. Now I'm split on the way that he reveals this fact. I always thought it was such a precious thing that he wouldn't want anybody to know about it. But their conversation ends with the Lion turning his legion to McCrag to root out Conrad Curse. This would be some of the first cracks in the Imperium that they have built as Gilliman would lean to not trust the Lion. His first attempts would be a failure and when he su suggests an alternative, Sanguinius shuts him down. As the Lion would then follow through the plan as intended, it would have some dire consequences later on. Curse organizes uh, sympathizers who would want to de depart from Gilliman's empire. They prove to be a huge problem with the Lion's plans. The Lion masks his own plans in order to fool Gilliman and Sanguinius, and it works because he manages to root out Curse. It climaxes in a duel between the two, where Curse has a secret plan in store, but after fighting him in the Unremembered Empire and hearing about what he did in the Pharaohs, the Lion finally is one step ahead of Curse. This part I really liked, as it, as it both shows that Curse is not too overpowered as he has been in the past stories, and it also shows some development for the lion that he learned from the previous mistakes. Curse still cries out that he cannot die now as he is destined to be killed by an assassin. After Curse has been captured and sets, and is set for trial, he reveals the lion's plans, which would essentially break the triumvirate. The lion is cast out and his sword is broken in two by the Gilliman. The lion wants nothing but to kill Curse for all the suffering he has caused, but he finally listens, listens to his prophecy and he realizes that Terra has not yet fallen. But for it to remain intact, he vouches to let Curse live for them to find out. Gilliman then realizes his big mistake in the Imperium Secundus and they set out for, to find the throne world, which will happen in the next novel called Ruinstorm. Now Curse says that his assassin is not born yet, which we know is a false, as she appeared in the novel called Nemesis already. It could be a mistake on Gav's fourth behalf, or that Curse is still wrong in his interpretations of his visions. It switches back and forth over the part on Caliban, and by this time I, could, uh, I should mention that the narrative is split between two storylines. One about the fallen angels on Caliban, and the other in Ultramar. Apparently Dan Abnett was supposed to write a novella about the Deathwing, but it was instead incorporated into this novel. 
This point of view mostly follows either death of Sahariel, Astellan or Lufer depending on exactly what's going on. Following from the short audio drama called Cypher, which was a part of the 2013 advent calendar, Sahariel barely made it out of the caves after Cypher left him in there to die. He would later begin to think that the Ouroboros from the Fallen Angel isn't a demon they should fight, but the spirit of Caliban in itself, which is a fallacy of him. Astellan, a character returning from the Call of the Lion, Fallen Angels and would later feature on in the Angels of Darkness, if you look at them chronologically, is handed terrible news as ships is translated into the system. Having heard that of Horus Rebellion, they dislike his cause just as much as the, the Emperor and the Loyalists. Astellan is annoyed that he wasn't no notified be first before Luther. Just as in the Master of the First Outer Drama, we don't truly know about his allegiances as they seem to shift from scene to scene. We actually have a picture of Astalan as we see it, as you can see right now, and we also get a face of how you can imagine him looking while reading the stories. So Harold would rather be reunited with them all. The Librarius is renamed into the Mistai to reaffirm Saharia's loyalties and further cuts off the bonds to Terra. Luther seems to dabble with Chaos teachings as well as, uh, as he's quite aware of the Ouroboros. But moving on, we would find out that, that the, the messenger is from Corswain, who needs reinforcements now that the lion is gone. So he sends Chapter Master Belaf, the pain in the back that sent Astellan back to Caliban in the first place. The moment he was mentioned, I was like, and he's dead. During their encounter, Sahariel uses rank Sar for Luther, where Belaf reminds them that the, the Legion went through many changes when they found Caliban, but adapting the titles of the Caliban was not one of them. I found this to be very strange, as many titles like Paladin and Cypher are definitely titles from Caliban. I also find it weird as Belaf is supposed to be the Caliban native, and he seems to have a personality of a stubborn Terran. I think he and Astellan has a per, uh, had a per personality switch which doesn't entirely fit them. Like for instance that Astellan should be the local native on Caliban with the, the personality of Belaf, and Belaf should be uh, the native of Terra with the personality of Astellan. Either way, he's there to collect fresh recruits as Corswain's war with Kalas Typhon of the Death Guard is taking a heavy toll on them, especially after the Framus Crusade. Luther would then reply that 30,000 new Dark Angels is waiting to join the war. But, but before they can join Balaf's fleet, they must commence a feast to celebrate, much to Balaf's disapproval. During their exchange, uh, exchange Sahariel finds out how his cousin died in the Lion novella. If you recall my review for that novella a couple of years ago, my consensus was that I did not like that development as it felt out of place and not in line with the Lion's character. The only positive outcome from this is, is that it has some consequences, actually. It is another factor to push Sahariel over the edge, which I didn't think was established pr enough prior to this. So my memory from Fallen Angels is that he is still loyal to the Lion and the Imperium. Here, he is a full-on traitor from the start, so this my cousin was killed by the li Lion had little to no impact on his turning over to the traitor side. Luther, on the other hand, tries to use this new information he's gathering to get more of them to their cause and secure Caliban both from the Imperium and the Horus Turncoats, so that they're separate from both sides. During the feast, which is not a, a very subtle Red Wedding-esque type of feast, you see it coming miles away, which is the biggest shame of it all. I think this could have had a major turnout if we had still fought the Dark Angels back on Cal Pal Caliban were still loyal to a degree and we did not entirely know what the decision would be. Uh, like that it, we, we would, me as a reader would still be guessing, oh, alright, will they kill them, will they not kill them, will they comply with sending them troops or what, what will they do? But, but I think this is the lack of planning in general for their storyline. But perhaps it would be difficult to, uh, to take us by surprise either way, as we already know the outcome. In order to distinguish supporters from non-supporters, they are either given a silver or a golden cup. One of their supporters is Grafane, also known as the Spearcast, a sergeant at arms and a former voted lieutenant of the Firewing. His position is in abeyance, which I take, in, take to mean that he is suspended temporarily, but not according to his brothers of the Firewing, as they still see him as their leader. 
While the feast is taking place, Astellan is taking over the fleet and taking back his old ship. When it is revealed of Luther's plan, he takes up the, an example of the story Grey Angel as the Imperium came to Caliban to investigate whether or not they were still loyal. It all leads to Sahariel killing Balaf and Cypher revealing him, himself of not supporting the cause on Caliban. Another 17 of the Dark Angels are killed for being loyal to the Lion and it creates a rift between Luther and Astellan. Sahariel and his librarians goes after the Guardian who kills at least one of them. Here it is shown that Sahariel is lost to think the Ouroboros is Caliban while Cypher knows it's to be a trapped demon. He is cornered and forced to reveal who he actually is. Sahariel apparently recognizes him, but the identity of the character is not revealed to the reader. His fate is actually left in a mystery as Sahariel orders them to make sure that nobody finds the body and warp energy entangles him. He is then elected as the new Cypher and they are like Hashtag not my Primarch. In the epilogue following all of this, we have a setup for Kalos Typhon as he's fleeing from the Dark Angels and we are given the idea that he will make an alliance with Luther, which will be explored further on in the short story called Exocytosis, written by James Swallow. So, what did I think about this novel? Well, uh, I, I think it balances between the two different split parts, uh, stories, storylines very well. But I would say the part uh, on Caliban is much weaker than the one is set in Ultramar. In Ultramar we have four different Primarchs who all want different things. First is Gilliman, uh, who wants to take everything carefully and slow like a true statesman uh, and a bureaucrat. Then we have the Lion, just like his personality in the Lima Rust novella, just wants results no matter how he gets them. Then we have Sanguinius tries to be the bargaining balance between the two and he unfortunately gets the short end of the stick in this story as he isn't featured that much in it I would say. But, and then lastly we have Conrad Kurtz uh, who just want to break chaos all around as, as he is vindicted. Uh, but I really, I really like the character development of the lion who of, finally after four years finally learned how to trick Kurtz uh, on his own field. But Curse uh, c would use that once again against him as, to, as well in the trial, providing them both with a win in their own separate ways. The parts of Caliban are very slow, like trying to build up a red wedding moment only to, for me to, as a reader to see it miles away. I think the stakes should have been much higher. And I also think that Gaff Forp made and uh, sh should have made it a more grey area to the end results, only the curveball us at the end. I also find it strange that Sahariel uh, was elected as a new cipher, as he doesn't fit in the role he is, was destined to become one of the grey knights as seen in Pandorax. Uh, I, I haven't read that novel, but according to others that seems to be the case that he is supposed to be one of the grey knights. So I will, I will get back to that in that novel and I will see if I think that's true or not. I also find it very strange that it wasn't revealed who the true cipher was, the older cipher was. But serving as the third entry in this sort of trilo trilogy about the first legion, it does feel equally connected to the previous stories. Uh, just as it's connected to the Imperial Secundus storyline and acting like a spin-off to spin-off sequel to the, the Unremembered Empire. And with a few nitpicks I did uh, in fact enjoy this novel quite a lot and, and I definitely recommend that you read it. I will give this novel 7 out of 10 forks and with that I will conclude this book review. Thank you very much for watching this book review and don't forget to rate and subscribe to my channel. Please give a thumbs up on my videos and also the comments of Alexander Goods, I keep on doing them and the negative take of Alexander Bad for improve or the content entirely. And also don't forget to share this with your friends if it could be interesting, entertaining or simply inspiring. And I'm also on Facebook these days, there's a link down in the description, check it out and see if you like it. I try and update more regularly there than I do here on YouTube. Not by much but a little to make a difference. Well with that said, thank you very much for watching this book review. For the Emperor! Bye!